Thank you for choosing to listen to this podcast from ABF, The Soldiers' Charity. I'm Lorraine Kelly. The Soldiers' Charity is 75 years old this year and this series of podcasts is our way of sharing a few of the stories of some of the people it helps. Today I'll be introducing you to two people whose lives were changed forever by war and conflict and finding out how they've adapted to their new circumstances. Maldwin Jones served with the 1st Battalion, the Welsh Guards, in Northern Ireland, Belize and Cyprus. In 1982, he was serving on board the Sir Galahad, a ship which was bombed and set ablaze in the worst British setback of the Falklands conflict. They did sort of explain to you what I was going through, I had survivor's guilt. So, and that's the only thing that really got to me at the time was the fact I was still alive and my friends were dead. Uh, I should be dead, they should be alive. This is quite a normal thing, apparently. Stuart Harris was also with the Welsh Guards. While on tour in Afghanistan in 2012, a roadside bomb hurled Stuart's vehicle into a ditch, leaving him with brain damage, the impact of which has left him partially sighted and partially deaf. I'd say the main reason guys suffer is because they will never be loved as much as they were by their men. You know, to put your life before someone else's, you know, happily die for one of any one of them. The conversation you're about to hear between Maldwin and Stuart took place recently at the hotel Maldwin now owns in North West Wales. Asking the questions is Dave Roberts. I'll take you back to the beginning. When I sort of joined up, I enlisted in August 75 and uh, 9th of September 1975, 9, 10am, I got the train from Bangor um, to eventually Brookwood Station and there's possibly two or three hundred young men my age, all 60 and all joining up as junior soldiers that day. And the recruiting sergeant was the Welsh Guardsman, and uh, Avion Jones uh, turned out to be a good friend. He called all the Welsh Guardsmen together and um, gave us a spiel. There's probably about a dozen of us, um, which is quite a lot from North Wales in one go. And he says, lads, don't forget now, not only are you joining the best regiment in the British Army, you're joining a family. N- none of us really understood what he meant by a family. Then as the years went on in, in the regiment, Basically, you got to know lads from all over. Like, back in the 70s, you only knew lads from your hometown, home city. You never knew lads from Carnarvon down the road or Llandaden. Well, definitely not real. I wouldn't have bothered with Stuart, you know, back then. Um, but that brought us together. I had friends from all over Wales. It's not just the next village, the next town. And these friends become family, became, you became close. You shared your intimate secrets with them. Uh, you'd share a bath with them, you'd share a shower with them. If you don't have a pack of cigarettes or a cigarette, you'd say, oh, can you borrow me a cigarette? And, you know, and if you had no money, they'd pay for you. And it was that kind of it was the uns- unspoken rule, really. They knew when you had a problem. You knew when they had a problem. I mean, more, more so than anything, 100% trust. I think I've heard you say to me in the past, it's a family that we chose for ourselves. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that was quite powerful. That's something that's always stayed with me. And I didn't realise it, like you said at the time, when it's said to you, you know, you'll never beat these days and when you're in, you don't quite realise that it's not no. until when we leave and you realise that they were the best days of your life. I mean, I left um, 26 years ago now. Yeah. I left before you joined. Yeah. And here we are now together yeah. and yeah. you are still part of my family. Yeah. So it's it's not just the guys you served with, it's something that just naturally happens because once you're a Welsh guy, always a Welsh guy. I remember one regiment Sam Major, um, Emily Pridham, um, very nice man, very good Sam Major. And um, regiment Sam Major in Berlin, 78, I believe. And uh, he described the Welsh guards, for selling Welsh guards, as a small Welsh village that moved around the world together. And I thought that's a fantastic description. And it's, the thing is, it still is the case now, yeah. but now it's. You know, it's a multicultural Welsh Guards village now, and it's completely different now. It's amazing how much it's changed, you know, and it's, it's, it's great. It's so much better these days. So, Val, I know that uh, when you came out of the army, you found it, you found it um, uh, challenging. Uh, what were those main challenges at the time that you came out? Feeling isolated, helpless, lost. There's quite a lot, and working in civil I mean, as squaddies, we've got a very, very dark sense of humour. We've got... A lot of sarcasm, low patience with civvies, because you're so regimented in the things are done, bang, 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 bang. It's told, do a job, you do it, get on with it. Uh, you don't faff about, you get it, you do it to your best ability, you finish, and you move on to the next task. But civilians, they're not like that, they pander about, and you have to explain to them twice, three times, what needs to be done, or... They don't understand their mentality, not at all. And it's, yeah, I mean, it teaches you 
to be organised and confident and it's I don't know what experience you, you had. I, I think I didn't realise until I was out I lived my life to a daily detail you do yeah so you know Ravalli 0600 yeah breakfast 0, 0630 and um, I've been out for the, the army for about six months I think it was and I was taking uh, the wife and the children to the dentist and it just suddenly dawned on me that I hadn't been to the dentist for a checkup for about eight months and I was like, because nobody had, nobody uh, no you. One had told me to. Yeah. 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 And I was like, come on, grow up. <laughs> you're in yeah. your 30s, you start doing... But you just, I just took it all for granted. You know, the company Sergeant Major would tell you when you were going to the dentist, they'd, you'd know what to wear every day. Yeah, yeah. You know, you yeah. wear, you're wearing pieces, you're wearing it in blue shorts and maroon T-shirt. Exactly, yeah. And, um, and everything was... Yeah, to a point done for yeah. you sort of thing and I know we said we're a bunch of men soldiers you know doing all this on the front line but really we're a bunch of little kids being told what to do all the that's, time that's, that's, but not really yeah. not a thing but yeah yeah so the call because yeah. well, my time in the army again going back you knew what to wear you know, they had 15 years in the police in uniform every day yeah. but when I came into the licensing trade I thought I was struggling what to wear for work so I just well Got three pairs of trousers the same mm. and loads of polo shirts <laughs> with a pub logo and that's it. Yeah. I was back in uniform yeah. behind the bar and to me, to me then I, I didn't have to think automatically, you know. So you, you mentioned that you spent time in the uh, in the police force when you came out of the army. What was that like being a police officer compared to being a guardsman? It's very similar. No discipline there at all. And I think a lot of police officers were lackadaisy and they'd come in unshaven. Dirty shirts, an iron shirts, dirty trousers, dirty boots, and that used to wind me up terribly. And when I was in the police, I was still the epitome of a guardsman. Boots slashed and shiny, even for clean uniform every day. Sometimes I'd change my shirt twice a day. But I think if you present yourself, yeah. and especially in a, when you're in a public position like a police officer, if you turn up, you're looking smart, you're looking the part, people are going to take more notice of you. And I didn't demand respect, I earned it, and I got on great with everybody, even the criminals. Even when I first took over the pub 11 years ago, the guys I'd arrested over the years popped in for a pint to see how I was. You know, I says, you were a fair cop, you were. And uh, you looked after us. And I was just doing my job. So, you know, that, 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 that's nice, you know. You've, you've commented before on the fact that you recognised quite early on that um, after having left the army, you were suffering from PTSD. Uh, what, what was that like? How did you come to the point of realising that... Uh, you may be suffering from PTSD. Well, the main point that came in, um, what year was it? Yeah, it was mid-97 mid it was. I'd come out of probation and training, passed that successfully, and North Wales Police then started the new scheme as a colleague supporter, because police is a very high-stress-related job, and there's a lot of police officers going off sick with stress-related issues. The force welfare officer at the time, Terry Wright, he noticed that there is a need for something to be done here. So he came up with an idea of setting up a colleague support scheme. I put myself forward for it because of my previous experience with the um, Northern Ireland and the Falklands campaign. My superintendent they thought at the time, well, you know, they called me and Mal, you put yourself forward for this course. You've only been in a job for two years, you, you know nothing. I says, well, I was in the army for 18 years and this is what I went through. So I explained my experiences in Northern Ireland and my experiences in the, in the Falklands, especially the scale I had. And I think, um, I said, I think I'm more than qualified. He goes, oh, I didn't know. So I did it. I ended up on the course in headquarters in Colwyn Bay. The course was going great. I put a lot of input into it because of my experience. And then on the day four, we um, covered into PTSD as a topic. And in the morning, um, PC Marion Jones, who got shot in Colwyn Bay, late 70s, I believe, and um, he came to speak about his experience. And when he was describing what, what happened to him, he was in old Colwyn, and the gunman came towards him and actually shot him. And he remembers the gunshot coming towards him in slow motion. Next thing, he hit his face and everything went back to normal speed. And that got me thinking about my day in the Galahad and the Thumb, because when we were on the Galahad, the, um, the warning came, there was jets in coming, and they came in that fast, you know, they came in at 500 mile an hour. He didn't even have time to react. And um, I was sat there looking up, and I could see the crane operator, the look on his face. And everything then seems to happen in slow motion. The crane operator, I, this is from my memory, I don't know if it's true, this is what I remember. He jumped from the crane to the, to the deck, all up, and that all happened in slow motion. People all around me moving around in slow motion. Next thing I recall is a big, is, is the, the tank deck of the Segal had just lighting up in pure white. And the only way to describe it really is like heaven on earth, you know, where they depict heaven on television, it's bright white light, isn't it? Next thing, it's if somebody just turned the light off. You, you felt the blast going over your head in um, normal speed and the heat and that. 
Um, I don't remember the uh, the noise, the explosion. I just remember the, the seeing everything happen and then the blast. And I thought, thinking about that then, I thought, it got me a bit sweaty. So lunch time, I said to tell you, right, the um, the course coordinator, listen, a uh, bit, 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 bit of an issue with that last session. Like, you know, it's, just, um, it's affected me a bit, so... But, you know, he asked me if it was okay to carry on. He said, yeah, I'm fine, I'm great, don't worry about it, I'll be fine. I've... And uh, in the afternoon session, we were doing the Bradford Fire. I sat there watching the footage of the Bradford Fire, the police footage, and um, watching that, it put me back on the ship. I was sat in the room, similar size to this one, and I was back on the ship. The sights, the sounds, the taste, the smell, everything. I was completely back on that ship, with a major, major flashback. But thankfully, I had my wits about me, and I knew exactly where I was. I was in police headquarters. So I just simply got up and walked out, broke down outside, said, right, come out, and they were good then. The, the, the force were very really good. And they organised counselling for me, professional counselling. So, and I was worried because I was going to get kicked out of the police because I'd joined and hadn't declared the fact I had PTSD. But I wasn't fully aware. I knew I was aware, but hadn't actually been diagnosed with it. And they did sort of explain to you what I was going through. I had sort of survivor's guilt. So, and that's the only thing that really got to me at the time was the fact I was still alive and my friends were dead. And I should be dead, they should be alive. You know, that's, which is quite a normal thing, apparently. But um, um. it's amazing how much one day few minutes in the day, 37 years ago, how much is the f- effect it still has on my life now, 37 years later? And it does. Yeah. Uh, but I cope with it. Left a scar on many of you, hasn't it? On the, yeah, yeah. On the yeah. Car, boys. Sometimes we just, even when we're in each other's company, we don't really so talk about it. Mm. So I'm quite thankful that you've you've been so... Because I didn't know all that about the, you know, the heat going over the top of you. And uh, I can... When I was blown up in the Mastiff, I do remember everything slowing down. Yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, one minute, you're going down the road, then... I was looking through the, the front of the windscreen, if you like, and then you see road, then the vehicle going up. I can remember the trees, and then all of a sudden the sky. Yeah. And exactly the same as well. I don't remember the blast, mm. but I remember being treated quite heavily in Birmingham QE for my ears, sort of stuff. I was on a steroid program on my eye, and yeah, as I got better physically, the, obviously the mental yeah. health side kicks yeah. in, and you remember the, the brothers that we lost, and um, to start... There was a few signs, and I, I didn't see it at the time, but I do now. I would struggle with tying my shoelace, and I remember crying one day because I'd forgotten how to tie a shoelace. And um, and then I remember going to the circus with the girls, and there was this cannon, and it, and it went off. I didn't think anything of it, and it shocked everyone. Ooh, you know, a bit of a jump. And I looked around, and everyone around me was wearing helmets, you know, mm-hmm. camouflaged helmets yeah. and body armour. And I, you know, shook my head and looked again and everyone was back to normal. And I, I, I went outside and once it just broke down, fell onto my knees and my hands and the, it'd been raining so it was all muddy and, and Rian came outside and I was like, I, I, don't, I don't feel well. I was diagnosed with them four letters, PTSD, and I've got a fantastic network around me. And, um, but at the time I, I didn't realise that at all. We are in a... Much we're much world. better now. It's not so taboo now, is it? No, and not um, we can talk about it. There's, there's not so much, you know, man up or anything like that. There's, there's people that will straight away come on, come and have a brew or whatnot. But that wasn't the case for many long ago, and uh, and it's it's such a shame. But I, and I was like that. I didn't ask anyone for help. I just thought I've I've got a man up and try and get through this. And I'd spend days arguing with myself. You go back and forth, and to the point where I just woke up one morning and. I wasn't a good dad and I was an even worse husband and the answer to me was to not be here anymore. Uh, so I went down to the to my beach and walked into the sea and I just thought I'm just going to swim out there until I don't have the, the strength to swim back. And I, as I waded into the water, um, I should have luckily had a vision of my girls getting bullied at school for what I was about to do. And I went back home, you know, absolutely soaking wet. I uh, went into the kitchen and uh, Rian was there, you know, just making some lunch and I told her what I was about to do and she, um, she called 999 and I was placed in a mental health unit. And I was there for about four months and they, they even struggled a bit, like, what to do with... because I was still a serving soldier at the time. My wife came to visit me about two months in or something and she said that, you know, how would, how would the guys that you'd lost... because I lost uh, th- three guys in, in our team. How do you think they'd feel? you wasting your time in here. It, it really hit me, you know, it really. And I did, I thought, I am wasting a gift here. I really am. And and I decided to try and help other people with if they're, you know, still having the battle in their mind. And I think we do quite a good job these days, don't we, Mal? You yeah. Know, together. 
They've got lads are more willing to talk now, especially yeah. um, since Afghanistan. They've got this trim, trauma risk, in, in instant management, isn't it? Which we didn't have back in our day. We, just, we would just sort of get on with it. When I joined, knowing the fact that I would get sent to Northern Ireland was there. And that they were some of the sort of violent, most violent times in Northern Ireland, um, shootings, IEDs, cabins, yeah. on a regular basis. And um, that didn't deter me, and it didn't no. bother me. And it surprised me when the first time I arrived in Belfast in the um, 23rd, 24th of October, 1979, on the Sir Galahad, funny enough, we sailed from Liverpool. And um, when we got off, I mean, we were going to South Armagh, bandit country. And we had these, all these coaches waiting for us, I thought, hang on. We're in bloody Northern Ireland. Yeah. There's going to be shoot, people shooting everyone. You're expecting the, the picture that people painted here. You arrive in Belfast docks and you're driving through Belfast and you're expecting to see terrorists running around with guns with, with hoods and masks on and cars going off and burnt out cars and shelled out buildings. But what you saw was normality. People going to work. The paper boy, the milkman, the postman. The delivery's going on. I thought, hang on, what's this? What's all about this? is going to be a doll this. You know, and, we, and the things we'd heard about South Armagh, the, the routes in, routes out, and it was deadly dangerous. That was, that was very worrying the first time. I thought, you'd be really crapping yourself, really. Um, but you joined up, though, in Afghanistan was going on, didn't you? Yeah, yeah so uh, it was more Iraq back then. Iraq, but can, yeah. I think, I think I probably joined the British Army at the most exciting time. You did, Maybe it's yeah. ever had. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I joined up at, at the age of 17, uh, flown to um, Bosnia with number two company, and then we went to Northern Ireland on a bit of a rotation for two years, uh, but that was cut, cut short for Iraq in 2005, and then Kosovo, and then Afghanistan. You know, yeah. a, a really busy time in my very what's considered short 13-year period. Now, in uh, 2005, you returned. Uh, returned to the Falklands. Falklands, yes, the first time ever. Yeah, uh, that came about. That's that journey started, but not for me, in 2002, the 20th anniversary of the Falklands. And there was a church that was held in Llandav Cathedral in Cardiff. And His Royal Highness Prince of Wales was present, and um, a few of the Welsh guards were there. And um, one of the lads, ex mortal student, Steve Hopkins, sort of complained to Prince Charles, there's, there's, there's nothing in the Falklands Islands Museum about the Welsh guards' involvement in the war. And Prince Charles simply turned around to him and said to him, what? What are you going to do about it? So we have to think at his feet. Is oh, well, it's a fair point because um, I know I'll, I'll get a photograph album created the Welsh the chronological history of the Welsh guys involved doing the campaign. And um, he's yeah, fine. Okay, you do that. And once it's done, let me know. I'll write the forward for it and sign it, and you can present it to the museum. It came then in 2004. Oh, sorry, yeah, 2004. The album was ready. Um, he'd given us three years, but he was ready within 18 months. Uh, in November 2004, we were invited to Clarence House with um, His Royal Highness um, to show him the album. And um, he, he'd written the forward. The album had been done a nice leather bound with gold braid and things like that. And he was going through the, through the album. And there's one particular photograph on it. It was taken 30th of July, 82, um, in Bryce Norton, where I met up with my dad um, coming home. And I didn't expect him to be there because I'd phoned home from the Ascension saying I'd be getting such and such a train, I'd be getting into Bangor. And you look out the window, you see hundreds of these people there. Oh, I wish Bob and Dad were here to see this. Like, you know, come down the plane. I look across my children's eyes, I see this little fella. I thought, my dad was dead excited. So I went across and he had hold of me. My dad's only, what, five foot one and I'm six foot. So he's looking up at me. And there's a black and white photograph of that moment. And all you can see is the raw emotion of my dad. So I'm looking at me with love. And, um, and that was it. And Prince Charles saw this photograph. He goes, "Wow, that's a powerful photograph." And one of the lads goes, "That's Mal, because he can't be. He's got hair." He says, "Don't you start?" <laughs> so, but quite surreal. Actually, we were in Clarence House drinking Earl Grey tea out of chef mugs, and we went to have the spoon. There's one silver spoon which the waiter came round to stir out tea, take it off as a wipe, as in case we nicked it. Then um, his Royal Highness turned around to Colonel Charles, who's with us, and uh, Charles. Says, who's taking this album to the Falklands? And he turned around and said, "Well, these lads are." Is that me? So, we'd, you know, we've only come here to present it, so we weren't expecting that. So, um, next thing, though, know, how is that? How we can't afford it, you know, back then. And um, so the regiment um, says, well, looked, looked into it. And um, so we were funded, you were part funded by the Army Benevolent Fund and part funded by the Welsh Guards, because there was no Welsh Guards charity back then. I think there was still money in the Falklands pot, I don't know. But um, it was a joint venture between the um, Army Benevolent Fund charity and the Welsh Guards. When you eventually left the Army, Talk us through how that felt in those first weeks, months, 
after yeah. eventually coming out. So um, I left the army a bit different to how you would normally do it. So the, the, the way it used to happen when I was in was uh, you'd sign off and you'd have about nine months to about a year to sort of sort your things out back home, look for employment, uh, sort your family out, accommodation, all that sort of stuff. From when I was blown up in 2012, uh, September 4th, uh, to being medically discharged in, uh, in October 2014, I was just in hospital. Um, and rehab centres. So as soon as I left there, there was you have to hit the ground. You hit the ground running. There was no resettlement or anything like that. You know, it's, it's one of the things. I'm a lot. You know, I'm okay now, but um, I did hold a bit of a bitterness over that. You know, not having the time to sort my, uh, you know, my things out. Uh, that brings me nicely onto well, not nicely onto, but when I was in the mental health unit behind the scenes, that was where the the soldiers charity looked after my family made sure they, they were all okay, made sure my girls were still going on school trips, things like that, uh, car tax, you know, these things could be viewed as small but made a massive impact on when I wasn't well enough to support my family. The charity stepped up to the mark and did exactly what they promised, you know, looking after soldiers, veterans and, and families, and it's nice to say that that is 100% true. But, yeah, going back to uh, leaving the Army, I came out 2014 and... I didn't know what to do. I was a, a 28 year old drawing a war pension. I was a pensioner at the age of 28, quite strange. I went a long time of not knowing what to do with myself, not knowing how to cope and no routine. Didn't realize my worth. I think, like I said earlier, I think that's been addressed now and I'm, I'm, I'm happy for that, I'm, I'm glad. So uh, a couple of years after you were injured, you, you suffered another uh, traumatic uh, Experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were um, burgled, but it was while I was on um, on medication to, uh, to try and help me sleep as well. So I would have uh, this very strong medication called quicotiapine. It pretty much knocked me out, if I'm honest. If someone came into the house, came in through the back garden, opened the door and took my car keys and my wallet and even my glasses. I went to the kitchen and that's where I'd seen that my glasses, uh, my, my glasses and my car keys weren't where they normally are. And I just walked into the hall, hallway, shouted up to Rihanna, who was in bed, and I said, "I think we've been, I think we've been burgled." And uh, she came, "What?" Came downstairs, and and then it transpired that we had. And I, I still say it now, you know, if I was to catch a burglar, you know, I'd, I'd lock the windows, I would, you know, have my way with them, sort of thing. But when you don't get that chance, it's um, I felt so violated and. It, it was horrible and it set me right back, you know, back to jail. Yeah, so I, I came off all medications and I thought, no one is going to burgle me again. I'm going to be here awake. And I started staying up at night, you know, sleeping in the day, becoming a bit of a problem, you know, sleeping on the couch in the front room. Kids were coming home from school and there I was, you know, once again, as I like, moping around. Nobody um, likes asking for help particularly, but you both talked quite openly about the help you have received in various different ways. How's that been, actually eventually asking for help and then and, and actually talking? Has it made, does it make life better? It makes life 100% better. Um, you, as soon as you've asked for help, there's this massive weight lifted off your shoulders. I've done it with Mal many a time, sometimes small scale, sometimes, but one of the smaller things is, oh, Mal, I've got a, uh, I've got a golf team. I'm, I'm struggling to find a sponsor to, uh, to get for serving soldiers to play in this golf day, you, you might sponsor it, Stuart, not a problem. So the bigger thing is like, oh my God, my, um, my daughter's uh, not had a great time in school this week or something like that, you know, can I come and have a, a, a bridge? Of course, Stuart, the door's always open, just come down. And, but it's, it's that old problem shared, problem halved sort of Yeah, thing. you pretend, yeah, you, you kid pretend. yourself you can deal with it, but you can't. You do, you do. I'm not one for asking for help, to pay for honest with it, because um, the system's let me down quite a few times when I have been to the doctor for help. This is right. We're organising some counselling for you. And 18 months down the line, you get an appointment out of the blue, and you go. He says, right, a quick assessment. Right, it's going to be another two years before you see. And I says, forget it. Forget I asked. Yeah. You know, I've tried looking for an answer at the bottom of the glass, bottom of the, bottom of the bottle. It's never there. So, and I know many soldiers do. Yeah, the first of July is coming up, and uh, that's when uh, we lost uh, Rodders and Tui. Yeah. Stephen, my multiple. Yeah. And. Um, I'll probably end up having a drink, yeah. Yeah, it's all specific um, dates, isn't it? Yeah. Like, keep it in your mind, you know, it's, it's always the same time of year. I get quite emotional. 
about a week before the Galhad event, up to the 14th of June. Then it all comes back then in the November, the Remembrance yeah. time. It's, um, I always make sure I attend the Remembrance Parades and meet up with the lads afterwards. It's much easier these days. And, but now it's great because all the lads from Bosnia, Afghan, yeah. Iraq, they're all yeah. there and we're, we're all well scared together. I came last year and I had a fantastic day. To Holyhead, was it? Uh, to, uh, sorry, not the Remembrance, the, uh, the Falklands. Well, the fo- I, I, I didn't go last year. I had a, fa- I had a fantastic it. day with the guys. I, th- I think it's so important, you know? these, um, the Falklands Memorial and Remembrance, because if we don't have... The only time you see the guys that live yeah. quite far away is a funeral. Yeah. And that's it's a sad... Yeah. It is, isn't it? Sad, it is, isn't yeah. It? Um, but yeah, like you were saying, it, 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 there's this strange unique bond that's forged in and the worse the the worse that the event you dealt with usually the stronger the bond becomes it is yeah because yeah. you know you've all escaped maybe i don't know escaped death together or mm-hmm. cheated it or or whatever or you've seen and experienced things that not many people would that work in a in a normal nine to five i think that's why so many people struggle and i've tried to study mental health now and and things like that and especially with combat ptsd I'd say the main reason guys suffer is because they will never be loved as much as they were by them men. No. You know, to, no. to, to put your life before someone else's. You know, I, I happily die for one of any one of them. There's, there's a special bond between everybody who went and part of the task force. Yeah. And, I mean, it's brought, I don't know how many of us went, thousands of us. We're all friends, we're all mates, we're all class of 82. It's brought the Welsh guys closer together, that yeah. bond. I think the Falklands brought us closer together as a family. Definitely. So you're, you're part of this massive, huge brotherhood. Even on the East of had uh, on the QB2 and post tour training, we got to know each other, got to know yeah. quite well, and we were good good lads, you know, and it's sad. Our medic so. picked up a, uh, he was a fantastic lad, Steve. He picked up a military cross uh, from that event uh, uh, when, we lo- we, when we lost Rodders and Suey and that. And, uh, and rightly so, he, he pretty much held the team together, uh, the medic. He but did, yeah, the medics, are the, they're always the unsung heroes, isn't it? Because we're infantry soldiers, we are frontline yeah. troops. Yeah. But in Afghanistan, Afghanistan was the front line. Yeah. And you had female medics under fire. And they say females can't be frontline soldiers. They were, right they were there. Year. They're right, right next, next year. year. They're yeah. taking incoming, but yeah. not, they're not returning fire. At least I no. can see where the enemy are. Crack they're actually they. dealing with someone you know. that's been... You know, is cut in half. You know, five meters behind yeah. me. And to, to hear to hear those stories, you know, it's so in, that yeah. that's inspiring. The women do exactly the same as the men, in yeah. my personal yeah. opinion. Of course, yeah. What does the future look like? So you've been through, you've been through your time in the in the, in the army. What has the army taught you that takes you now through, and your experiences with the army that take you forward into uh, the next phase of your lives? I think uh, the army's given me all the tools that I need to crack on loyalty, integrity, you know, how to network correctly, how to hold yourself, how to carry yourself in any sort of situation, how to deal with things on, on, on the hoof, you know, quickly. And I, what I enjoy doing now is being able to help and advise other people that are, are struggling. But, you know, going forward, I'd just like to say to people, you know, that, that there is help there. You can always talk to people. We're lucky in the Welsh Guards. We have a fantastic association. And, uh, and I'm hoping to get my teeth sunk into a bit more and helping a few more guys. You hear about someone, there's been two guys this year that have committed suicide. And um, it's, it's so heartbreaking when you you, don't, you only live in the next town and you, you're just like, I could have done something. Yeah. yeah so, so Mal, going forward, you're looking at some retirement pensions? Going, going forward, yeah. Well, I'm a double pension already. Um, well, a triple pension, actually. I've got a war pension, police pension and an army pension. So I'm, I'm quite lucky in that respect. And thinking I'd be great, be well off when I get all these pensions when I'm 60, but I want to become a charity pensioner. And I've that's been on my mind the last 20 years. I've looked into it I meet the criteria. So when it comes to the age, I'm going to uh, apply. <clears throat> One of the main reasons why I miss the camaraderie, the banter, the army life. I'm only at the happiest when I'm in the pub, when Mike Bowby used to organise a lot of get-togethers in my other pub, didn't he? and we used to get once a month to get together. Yeah. Always a fantastic night. Um, you get new faces come all the yeah. time, the banter, the crack, the Mickey taking, you know, and you're drinking like you're, you're a sick 18 year old again and no hangover the next day, it's fantastic. So I don't think I'll be able to do that as a Chelsea pensioner, but I want to go back into that environment. It's a way of life, isn't it? The only proper job I've had is a paper round. Army, way of life, police, way of life. This game, definitely a way of life. So yeah, retirement, that's, I'm prepared. You've been listening to Maldwin Jones and Stuart Harris speaking with Dave Roberts from the Soldiers' Charity. Thank you to Stuart, to Maldwin 
and to all the staff at the Gazelle Hotel in Anglesey. Please do check out the rest of the podcasts in this series as every episode has people whose stories deserve to be heard. If you'd like to know more about ABF, the Soldiers' Charity, in this, its 75th year, then just visit soldierscharity.org where you'll find everything you need. I'm Lorraine Kelly. Thank you for listening and thank you for your support.